This will be part one of the overview for the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation has 22 chapters, 404 verses, and around 12,000 words. It's 90 AD, and the author is John, the Apostle John. Now, our three applications. Historical, John writes to seven churches of Asia Minor of his day, and he writes to reveal to them the coming day of the Lord. Doctrinal, it's written to tribulation saints to explain events that are going to be unfolding around them. And John is put forward in time to see it with his own two eyes. Devotionally, what me and you can get out of it, it shows the history of the church age in chapters 2 and 3. And the rest of the book shows events that we will bypass when we leave in the rapture. So it should be a reminder to be thankful that we've been delivered from the wrath to come. Now the key verse is Revelation 1.10. Where John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I believe that's the key verse. And that verse helps you understand what's going on in Revelation. And the book of Revelation isn't in order chronologically, but I believe it was in order of how John saw it. And he wrote it down as he was shown things from the Lord. And it may or may not be in chronological order in some spots. Some spots it is, some spots it's not. But that key verse where he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What I believe is going on there is John was picked up by the Spirit and taken forward in time. And he saw the events of the coming tribulation play out before his eyes. And that's what you're reading about in the book of Revelation. And I'll show you more on that later. And I believe that there are five accounts of the tribulation within the book of Revelation. And I've heard many different views on it, and I, I don't think it's something to argue about. Uh, I've heard some people say that it's just one long account, and the entire book is in chronological order. I've heard some people say it's two accounts, that it's uh, the first account is 1 through 12, with the rest being thir the second account, 13 through 19. And I've heard that there's four accounts. But I believe that there's five accounts. I believe the first account of the tribulation is in chapter 6 through 7, where you got the horses, the four horsemen, the riders, and the seals. I believe the second account is 8 through 11, where you got the trumpets. The third account is chapters 12 through 14, where it talks about the devil and the antichrist. I believe the fifth account is chapters 15 through 16 with the seven vials. And the fifth account, 17 through 19, Babylon the Great. I believe each one of those accounts shows you a different look at the tribulation. Just like the four gospels gives you a different look at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Now the breakdown chapter by chapter breakdown I believe the book of Revelation the way it's laid set up uh, shows you a, a premillennial look and chapters 1 through 3 can represent the church age so for chapters 1 through 3 I've got the church age because you got John talking about churches and I'm aware that those churches are not only represent churches during his day, they also represent churches that will be here in the tribulation. But at the same time, they each church can represent a certain time period in church history. So for chapters 1 through 3, I got that representing the church age. Then chapters 4 through 5, you got John raptured. I believe John is sees the rapture of the church there in chapter 4. 
And then in chapter 5, you got something that will remind you of the judgment seat of Christ. So you got the church age in chapters 1 through 3. 4 through 5, you got a rapture in the judgment seat of Christ. Now chapters 6 through 18, what you have is all those accounts of the tribulation. So for chapters 6 through 18, I've put tribulation. So chapters 1 through 3, church age. 4 through 5, John raptured. 6 through 18, tribulation. And in chapter 19, of course, second coming. You got Jesus come out of, coming out of heaven on a white horse. Chapter 20, I've got the millennium. 21, you got the new heavens and a new earth. Chapter 22, eternity. So you see how the just the outline of the book itself shows you the proper outline of the all the coming future events. And another key verse is Revelation 119, where it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So John uh, writes the things which he has seen, which are, and the things which, which shall be hereafter. And I've got that the things which thou hast seen would be chapter 1, the things which are, chapters 2 through 3, and the things which shall be hereafter, chapters 4 through 22. Now, with that being said, let's jump into the book, chapter 1. Revelation 1.1 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. A lot of people believe that you shouldn't do a verse-by-verse verse of Revelation or spend too much time in Revelation because they say it, it just appeals to the flesh. Now, I completely disagree. The focus of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The theme is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming and the flesh of wicked men gets ate by the birds at the end of this book. So I just don't see that it appeals to the flesh. If anything, it's against the flesh. Uh, the focus of the book isn't on the Antichrist. It's about Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the victorious person in the end. So if you keep the focus where it should be, keep the main thing the main thing, Rev the book of Revelation is not going to appeal to the flesh. But he's going to reveal some things. He says, these things are going to shortly come to pass. Shortly come to pass. Very true. Take into consideration how the Lord views time. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. With that in mind, it is going to shortly come to pass. Uh, keeping that in mind, this was just... If you... Take that into consideration. God sees the book of Revelation being written just a couple days ago. So it is going to shortly come to pass. Revelation 1-2, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So the testimony of Jesus Christ, what's that? Well, in Revelation 19-10, it says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So John bears record of that. He bears record of the word of God. He's going to stay true to the words that he hears spoken and of all the things that he saw. John doesn't just get to hear what's going on or read what's going on. He's going to actually see it. He sees it unfolding before his eyes. He sees it. And imagine, a, imagine time as a DVD, like a DVD menu where you can go to that menu and you can select any scene from beginning to end. Like a scene selection of time. The Lord sees it even clearer than that. He simply picks John up from one scene and places him at the last scene. The last scenes of the Bible. You see, Revelation isn't written in chronological order. But it seems to be written in the order that John saw the things happen. And I'll explain that more to you as we go. 
You say, well, that's hard to follow if it's not written in chronological order. But no, it's not. Think about it like this. The movies and the TV shows do the same thing. They would take you back in time and they'll show you a glimpse of something in the, in the, within the movie. Then you'll be in the present time again. And then it might even show something in the future in the movie and then bring you back to the present. And you got the character, it has the character going back and forth from maybe when he was a child to the present time and back and forth like that. You know, the movies do it, the TV shows do that, and you don't have a problem with that. Why would you have a problem with the book of Revelation not being in complete chronological order? And I'm going to show you why it really doesn't make sense to have it all in chronological order. And that may go against what you've always uh, heard or believed. But if you'll just give me some of your time, I'll explain to you why I believe that. Now, Revelation 1-3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So you get a blessing just for reading it. Throw out the sermons and books by those guys who say you shouldn't read Revelation. That's crazy. Why should there be a certain part of the Bible that you shouldn't read? You know, you need to read it, hear it, keep it. I've had people come in the break room and they'll say, you're reading Revelation, why are you reading that? And this is Christians saying this. Well, why would I throw out the 66th book of the Bible? Revelation 1-4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So John is about to write to the seven churches and he's getting the revelation from Jesus Christ, the one who is, which was and is to come. And he was here in eternity past. He's here in the present and he's going to be coming back on a white horse. And the seven spirits are before his throne. And this doesn't mean God is seven spirits. It just means... He can manifest himself as much as he wants to. I mean, think about it like this. He's in you right now, wherever you're at, but he's also in me. Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now look at these seven spirits. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You got the Spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah 11, 2. Now, Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus Christ is the first to rise from the dead and never die again. He's the first begotten of the dead. And he, he loved us, and he proved it on the cross. He washed us. From our sins in his own blood. Acts 20.28 20, said God purchased us with his own blood. Revelation 1.6 says. And has, hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now once you get saved you become royalty. In the millennium you can be a king. And reign over cities. And the Bible says if we suffer. If we suffer with for him, we also reign with him. And you're also a priest who can offer up spiritual sacrifices. He made us kings and priests. And Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So this is the theme. This is the theme of Revelation. The Lord coming back at the second coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him. And this isn't him coming to get us at the rapture. This, What this verse is talking about, this event, takes place seven years after the rapture, at least. Where it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And they're going to run for the hills. They're going to hide in the dens and rocks of the mountains from the Lord on a white horse. Now, Revelation 1, eight, I am Alpha and Omega, Jesus says. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. The Almighty. You don't believe Jesus is God? Well, he declares to be the Almighty. 
Don't you remember he said, before Abraham was, I am? Don't you remember in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? And Revelation 1, nine, John says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is in exile because he won't stop bearing record of the word of God, and he has the testimony of Jesus Christ, and that is the spirit of prophecy. He could go around and boldly say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or you'll go to the same hell as the rich man. He could boldly say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll have eternal life. That's the spirit of prophecy. He's, he's telling you the future. And you see, we don't have prophets today like they did in the Old Testament, like with Elijah and Elisha. But you could be a prophet just by getting a Bible, reading what the Bible says about the future, and then repeating those words. That is... It's prophesying. That's what prophesying is now. When you prophesy now, you have to use the Bible because only the Bible can tell you the future. God's not going to come to you in a vision or a dream or something like that. You've, you've got to get it from the Bible itself. And the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 1.10 I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now this verse is key. He was in the Spirit. That's a key phrase. And there's a lot of different um, beliefs about what that phrase means. But I believe if you get this phrase right, it's really going to help you understand what's going on that phrase. In the Spirit. So what does the phrase mean? And I just don't want to just tell you what it means. And say, well, that's the way it is. That's how it's going to be. I want to show you scripture to explain why I believe that it means what I believe it means. So in the spirit, look at Ezekiel 37, 1. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. So the hand of the Lord was on Ezekiel, carried him out in the spirit of of the Lord and set him down somewhere else, specifically here in the Valley of Dry Bones. Now look at the book of Revelation itself and see this phrase. Revelation 17, 3, it says, so he carried me away. Notice that again, carried me away. John being carried somewhere, carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Now look at Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away. Once again, someone being carried. And he carried me away in the spirit. There's that phrase again. To a great and high mountain. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So when John is in the spirit, he is carried away somewhere else geographically. Just like how in Acts 8, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Now, was he was his body left in autopilot on the Isle of Patmos? I don't know. Um, but he was part of him was carried somewhere else and shown the things that he's writing about in the book of Revelation. Okay, so in the spirit means the spirit literally took John somewhere else and showed him some things. So he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Well, what's the Lord's day? Well, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is what? What is the day of the Lord? Well, it can cover a long amount of time because you know why? A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. But primarily it refers to the second coming. But you'll find where the day of the Lord covers... From the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, all the way up to the great white throne judgment. And that's what you got in the book of Revelation. Also, don't forget the context of the chapter and the book of Revelation itself is John being carried forward in time to see end times events and write about it. So John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. 
the day of the Lord. Well, you say that's different. The Lord's day and the day of the Lord. Well, you've got your birthday and the date of your birth. That's the same. Just because it's not the exact same phrase doesn't necessarily mean it's not the same. Now, I don't believe the Lord's day refers to Sunday because every day is the Lord's day. Um... A lot of people get the idea that Sunday is a special day set apart from all the rest. But actually, it's really not. It, Paul even says, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So it's not so much a, a separated day that... Uh, because... Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I mean, think about it like that. If it was a, if it was the Lord's day, then you couldn't be fully persuaded in your own mind. You would have to say, this is the day. This is a special day we need to set aside. But we don't have a certain day like that, you know, like they had the Sabbath. They had, the Jews had to keep the Sabbath. You know, you could go to church on Saturday and it wouldn't matter. If a, ch if a church chose to meet on Saturday instead of Sunday, I don't believe that, that that matters. And I know the disciples met on the first day of the week, but Paul came back and said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind about it. So John's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I believe that's the day of the Lord. And if you want to believe that's Sunday, then that's perfectly fine too. But I believe that this really helps you understand and such that's the this is the key verse because john's saying i was in the spirit on the lord's day and he's being carried away in the spirit and shown the end times events and that's what's going on revelation 111 saying i am alpha and omega the first and the last and what thou seest write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in asia and to ephesus and unto smyrna and unto pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. He says, what thou seest, write in a book. John is going to not only write things that he hears, but he's actually seeing it with his own two eyes. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now the description of the, of the Lord here puts you in the context of the day of the Lord. Even the descriptions of the Lord. It puts you in the context of the day of the Lord, the second coming, because John is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It is it is like John is right there speaking to the Lord in the future, right before or right as the second coming happens, and the Lord's talking to him there. Notice, because notice it says, His eyes are as a flame of fire. Just as it says at the second coming in Revelation 19.12, uh, Jesus Christ went to the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, Jesus calls hell a furnace of fire. So it makes sense that his feet are as if they burned in a furnace. And when the three Hebrews were th threw into the furnace in Daniel, Jesus walked in. So his feet are as fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. He's walked through that fire. He's been in the furnace. And at the second coming, he comes in flaming fire taking vengeance so his feet are as if they burned in a furnace in revelation 1 16 and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength the sharp two-edged sword matches what comes out of his mouth in revelation 19 again the second come the greatest second coming chapter He's got a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It says in Revelation 1.16 here, where John's in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the Lord has out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. And when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, 
He's called the Son of Righteousness. S-U-N of Righteousness. In Malachi 4.2. He's called the Son of Righteousness arising with healing in His wings. And what does it say in Revelation 1.16 here? Putting you in the context of the second coming. It says His countenance was as the sun shineth in His strength. And John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So he was alive. He died on the cross for me and you. He was buried and rose again. Now he's alive forevermore. He went down to the heart of the earth. He took the keys of hell and of death from the hierarchy down there you see hell has gates hell has bars hell has chains it's a real physical place and jesus took the keys and he says in revelation 119 write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter the things which thou hast seen that's what he saw in chapter one the things which are that's what he's going to see in chapters two through three and the things which shall be hereafter is what he's going to see in chapters 4 through 22. In Revelation 120 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now notice the Bible defines itself. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Now, chapter 2. Now, we're going to get into these seven churches. And first up, you got the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus means fully purposed. And like I said, each one of these churches can represent a certain time period in church history. Ephesus is going to picture the early apostolic church with the apostles. It's uh, going to be 33 A.D. to 200 A.D., the, the foundation of it is the apostles. And when the apostles are dead, it's carried on by the apostolic fathers who were saved men, but they would eventually bring in bad doctrine. In Revelation 2 and verse 2, speaking to the church of Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how good thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. So this church couldn't bear them which are evil. They were intolerant of it. When Lot was in Sodom, the people's evil deeds vexed his righteous soul from day to day. You see, the, the evil going on in this world should bother you, and you should be intolerant to it. And this church has tried them, which say they are apostles, and has found out that there's a lot of false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, as 2 Corinthians 11.13 talks about. So you need to try the people that come to you. Um, you got all these people saying that they're apostles today. There are no apostles today. you got a lot of people just claiming to be a preacher, but they don't even have the right gospel. They don't even have the right Bible. They don't even have the right doctrine. So you need to try those which say they are apostles, are preachers, and are not. And it says in Revelation 2, 3, and 4, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see, there is always room for improvement. He compliments them. Then he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You see, there's always room for improvement. There's always somewhere in there for you to get things right. Never reach a point where you think you've maxed out and you can't improve anymore because you're always going to be improving and growing until you get a new body. First Thessalonians 3.10 Paul says, Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You see, there's always something you can perfect. There's always something you're lacking. There's always something you can do better and, and start doing or stop doing. 
There's always something you need to start doing and always something you need to stop doing. So stop doing something and in place of that thing that you stop doing, start doing something else. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, five, And beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith. See? There's something you need to add to your faith. Not staying the same, but growing. He says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So you keep adding things to it. Add things to your arsenal. Revelation 2, five. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of the, his place, except thou repent. So he tells this church to do the first works. And remember the thing that you used to do that made you stay in love with God and his word? Do that. Do the first works. Do that again. If you feel like you, you've left your first love, go back and do the things that you used to do when you first got saved that was making you stay in love with God and stay in love with the Bible. Revelation 2, 6 through 7. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So God hates some things. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You see, men, you don't need to worry about overcoming. We've already overcome. In 1 John 5, 5, it says, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, remember these churches, when you're reading them, they got so many different applications. The Bible is written in such a way that any person from any age could pick up the Bible and read it and get something out of it. You got to remember that. Now, remember the tribulation application. For these seven churches. If they overcome. They get to eat from the tree of life. In Revelation 22 and verse 2. It says in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river. Was there the tree of life. Which bare tw twelve manner of fruits. And yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree. Were for the healing of the nations. And in verse 14 of Revelation 22. It says blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life. And may enter in through the gates into the city. You see we don't have to eat off of the tree. But some people will have to. You see I'll, I'll already be in a glorified body. In Revelation 22. Some people won't be in glorified bodies. Some people will have to eat off of the tree. To be able to live forever. Just like Adam and Eve would have done if they ne if they had never eaten off of the wrong tree. If they had never eaten off the wrong tree, they would have took of that tree of life and lived forever. You see, there's going to be people who don't get glorified bodies. The only people promised glorified bodies is people from the church age. The tribulation saints aren't promised a glorified body. The millennial saints aren't promised a glorified body. So obviously, they're going to eat off the tree of life and live forever that way. It says in Genesis 3.22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Talking about Adam and Eve right after they ate off the tree. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So you see, the tree of life will cause you to live forever if you eat off of it. But you'll already be calls to live forever because you're going to have a glorified body at that time but now let's look at the church in Smyrna Smyrna means myrrh and this represents the time period in church history from 200 AD to 325 AD and it's a persecuted church and pagan Rome kills Christians during this time but the more they're persecuted the more they multiply, kind of like Israel was. The more Pharaoh put hard bondage to them, the more they grew and multiplied. So it says in Revelation 2, 8 and 9, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. 
So they are in poverty, and yet they are rich. Remember the tribulation saints can't buy or sell. They are poor. They're in poverty according to worldly standards, but they're rich in the eyes of God. Lazarus in Luke 16 was poor in the eyes of this world, but rich in the eyes of God. The opposite was true for the rich man in Luke 16. He was rich in this world, but he was poor in the eyes of God. He tells this church in Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. See, that's a rough verse if you think about it. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer, he said. That's a tough thing. In 1 Peter 3.14, it says, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. I believe that if you get close enough to God that you won't be afraid of anything except the Lord. Imagine if you could look a monster in the eye and laugh. Because you know that you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can look danger in the face and know everything's going to be okay because if something happens to this body, oh well, you're getting a new body. If the body dies, oh well, your soul departs and goes to be with the Lord. You see, there's a boldness that comes along with being a Bible-believing Christian who is prayed up and living right and has their affection on things above. It can make you fearless because you know that nothing can touch your soul. Your soul's untouchable. It says in Job 5.22, At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. You see, there's this fearlessness that comes along with being very close to the Lord and believing the Bible and knowing that nobody can touch your soul. It's invincible. Uh, I think Paul was fearless like that. And it's easier said than done. But if you think about it, all people can hurt your body. They can't touch your soul. They can't touch your rewards. Revelation 2.11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Me and you won't be hurt of the second death. If, we're, if you're saved, you won't be hurt of the second death. I've already overcome because there was a day when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was my second birth. If you've got the second birth, you're not going to be hurt of the second death. The second death is the lake of fire, as it says in Revelation 21.8. It says, She'll have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the tribulation saint will have to overcome the temptations that will be there in the Antichrist kingdom. And if he gives into the beast system, then he will be doomed for the second death. Next is the church in Pergamos. Pergamos means much marriage. And if this is going to be a picture of a certain time period in church history, then it could be A.D. 325 to A.D. 500. And during this time, you have the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. And it says in Revelation 2.12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now remember that Roman Catholic Church and that belief system, they killed Christians while pretending to be Christians. They killed Bible believers specifically. Just uh, like this guy Antipas here. He died a faithful martyr. And the Lord is looking for people who will hold fast like Antipas would have. Who wouldn't deny the faith even when facing death. And he's looking for somebody who's going to stick their neck out as a faithful martyr. And Antipas could literally say... He stuck his neck out for the Lord. And the saints who get beheaded stuck their neck out for the Lord. 
they lose their head, but end up with it back on their shoulders and a crown on top of it. It says in Revelation 2, 14 and 15, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You see, the Lord just wants them to fix their doctrine. The Nicolaitans, that doctrine has to do with the clergy over the laity. Meaning they think there is a big dog like a pope who's ranked up high and everyone else is down low. Or the priest is more important than the common layman person. And God hates that. Everybody's equal. We don't look to each other. We only look up to Jesus Christ. And if it's, it's cool to have pastors and teachers and mentors, obviously, but Jesus Christ and the Scriptures are the final authority, and any man can go to the Scriptures and end up knowing more than his teachers. It says in Revelation 2.16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That is that sharp two-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of the Lord at the second coming. Revelation 2.17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So the hidden manna, it seems the Lord's going to supply the saints with food once again, just like he did in the Old Testament. Now the church in Thyatira. Thyatira means odor of affliction, and during this time, the body of Christ is going to be persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. If you apply the church in Thyatira as a certain time period in church history, and this church period brings in the Dark Ages, and the church is persecuted like never before, and this time period could be 8,500 to 81,000. Now remember, even though these represent certain time periods in church history, they also represent a church in John's day. They also represent a church in the future tribulation. And you can also get some practical stuff out of it for you today. Revelation 2.18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now notice each time he addresses another angel, uh, of a church, he gives us different details on the risen Savior. Here he says, Who hath his eyes like a faint flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. But when he addressed the angel of the church in Pergamos, he said, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. Revelation 2.19 I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Do you ever feel like the good things you do are going unnoticed? Because they're not. The Lord knows all about it. He says, I know that works. Charity, service, faith, patience. He knows about the bad stuff too. And he, he tells them in Revelation 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. You see, they got this woman preacher in there. And this old Jezebel calls herself a prophetess. But she's no such thing. She's teaching them and seducing them into committing spiritual fornication. And the Lord doesn't want them eating things sacrificed to idols. And now this shows a dispensational difference here because today we can eat anything as long as we can give thanks for it and don't cause a brother to stumble by exercising our liberty to eat it. But it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 7 through 9, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You see, 
You can eat any any meat, but just don't let it become a stumbling block to somebody who believes that that meat is wrong to eat. And Paul even says in 1 Timothy 4, 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. So can you eat it? Well, can you give thanks for it? Then you can eat it. Revelation 2.21, it says he gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she repented not. He gave her space because God's long-suffering. 2 Peter 3.9 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. She never would repent and get it right. So he says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Some of the saints in the church are sleeping with the enemy, and they've been caught with their pants down. And here he says, I'm going to cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. And he says, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But I say unto you, and unto the rest in Thyatira, and as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Notice it says, keepeth my works unto the end. This shows a different setup for the tribulation. Looking at this church and apply it to a tribulation saint, there are conditions that the saint has to meet. How could me and you apply the verse to us when it says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power of the nations? Well, me and you have already overcome. But if we keep works to the end, we will also reign with him over nations. You see, if you suffer with the Lord, you'll reign more in the millennium. Your salvation is secure. Nothing can change it. But your rewards can change. Your reign over cities can change. Revelation 2, 27 through 28, And he shall rule them with a the rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him, I will give him the morning star. The morning star is the Lord Jesus. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, chapter 3, we get into the church in Sardis, and Sardis means red ones, because this church period is also stamped with bloodshed and the Spanish Inquisition. And the time period could be A.D. 1000 to A.D. 1500. If you're looking at this church as representing a certain time period in church history, Verse 1 says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Notice once again he gives different details to each church of the about the risen Savior. And he says, Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. So strengthen the things that remain. The good things that you presently have going for you can be strengthened. He says in, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise, strengthen, strengthen the things which remain. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and that they should walk worthy with me, walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the shame shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. You see, everyone's name everyone's name starts out in the book of life. And since me and you are saved and sealed unto the day of redemption, we don't need to worry about our names being blotted out anymore. 
They can no longer be blotted out. We've already overcome. We've already got our white robes reserved for us. And he's not going to blot out our name out of the book of life. Now, the next one, the church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. The time period could be A.D. 1500 to 1900. And this is the greatest time in church history. And the church, this church period sees the King James Bible translated. And they're the ones who are said that they kept his word. He says in verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So they kept his word. And I want it to be said of me that I kept his word. I never want to change it, add to it, or take away from it. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Nobody can take your crown unless you let them. But there are some men out there that if you follow them, you will lose your reward. Now, me and you today, we can't lose our salvation. But you can lose a reward. You can lose a crown. Uh, the devil doesn't want you to have reign over anything in the millennium. He believes it's all his. So he will place men in your life that can take your crown if you let them. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Notice, New Jerusalem comes down. It comes down out of heaven. When you think about it, you don't really spend eternity in heaven. Heaven comes down. A little piece of heaven comes down to you. And uh, it says, and I will write upon him my new name. How would you like to be autographed by the Lord himself? Now the, the next one. Laodicea. The church of Laodicea. Laodicea means rights of the people. And the time period could be eighty nineteen hundred 1900 to the rapture. This is the church period we're in now. This is the church that goes into apostasy. This is the worst condition the church has ever been in. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. One way to look at this is if you're lukewarm, you're satisfied. If you're hot or cold, which the Lord would have you be all hot or cold, then you're not satisfied and you're wanting to do more and more. For the Lord. But if you're lukewarm, you're satisfied. You're staying put. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. See, that's what Hollywood says. They say, I'm rich. I've got need of nothing. That's what a lot of Christians act like. They think they know the whole Bible and don't need anything else. And the world's philosophy is just like this church. But they don't realize that they are wretched, and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And a lot of mega churches out there have nice buildings and millions of dollars. They don't have the word of God, so they are miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. He wants them to go through trials, and come out as gold. He wants them to put eye, eye salve on the eyes because they are blind to the things of God. They haven't kept his word like the Philadelphia church did. So they become more and more blind to the truth. He says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You see, they won't ever let the Lord in. They just think he's telling a knock-knock joke. Uh, they can't ever get to a point where they take the Christian life serious. But he says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father 
in his throne.